Welcome to this talk on bootstrappable Debian. Uh, I'm Wookie, just in case you didn't know that. Um, this talk may be slightly random because it's a little bit complicated uh, and uh, I like to think that I can explain to you how this all works without being terminally confusing. So, uh, this is about various things. Bootstrapping is when you need to make a new architecture, fundamentally. That's the main use case in Debian. If you wanted to actually build everything from scratch, how would you go about it? Um, it's actually very hard because of the way our system is always built on what we already have. So there's no requirement to build it all from nothing. And in fact, you can't. So this is a real problem every time we start a new architecture. So I'll talk about that, uh, why that's a problem and what we might be able to do about it. Uh, fundamentally, the problem is cyclic build dependencies. You can't build this because it needs itself, or at least there's a loop of things such that it needs itself. Uh, I've done some analysis on exactly how big a problem that is in Debian and Ubuntu. And strictly speaking, bootstrapping the architecture is nothing to do with cross-compiling. It's fundamentally independent of that, except that in practice, uh, that's the only way to do it. Uh, so the two subjects are highly intertwined. So I'll talk a little bit about that at the end, just what's going on. Um, I've been doing this work essentially because of Linaro. Uh, it's, all, it's actually quite a long way down my list of things I'm supposed to be doing. So uh, I'm not really supposed to be worrying about how hard it is to bootstrap Debian. Uh, so anyone who wants to help will make things move along much quicker because people who give me lists of things to do put this one down at about number six. Nomenclature is a problem. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, cross-building, uh, the GNU names are terminally confusing to anyone who doesn't know all about it already. Build is the machine you're actually building on, and host is the thing you're targeting. Um, that's not the same as target. Confusing, isn't it? I'll try and use the correct terminology throughout, just so I'm not confusing. Uh, also, um, deciding how to do this so that it makes sense to package maintainers is, is tricky. Uh, you know, it's important that the terminology of whatever gubbins mechanism we come up with makes sense to a random package maintainer who's got to read it in their packages. So um, I've used in the documentation about this both staged builds and bootstrap builds for the same concept. So those mean exactly the same thing, uh, and which it should be is kind of up to you guys, which seems most useful. Staged is already used in some packages, uh, most noticeably uh, GCC and the bootstrap builds. Um, for a while, I thought Bootstrap made more sense, but the problem with that is that it means six other things as well. So actually, I've kind of changed my mind and gone back to staged builds. When talking about dependencies, um, there's actually two sorts of dependencies. There's build dependencies and what we call dependencies. But I shan't use the term dependencies at all here. I'm going to talk about install dependencies, because otherwise, everything I say will appear to be nonsense. It's important to distinguish between the dependencies you need um, because you need them to build, and the dependencies you need because you need them to install. So, uh, as I said, strictly speaking, you can bootstrap without cross-building, except that in practice you can't, because you've got to build at least the toolchain, uh, and then once you've done that, you might as well build a few more things cross, and so on. And there's an interesting question about how much stuff you should build cross before you call that a native system and build the way we normally do. You know, you could build the whole damn thing cross, in theory. Uh, People take different approaches in different ports, and there's different trade-offs. Um, but there's always some. So that's what makes these two subjects closely related. There's a concept of the set of things which you, know, you have to produce as if by magic from somewhere. Uh, that's pretty much uh, the tool chain and um, some base packages and the any language which depends on itself to bootstrap. Language authors like writing their language in their own language, um, which is all very nice, except when you have to build the damn things. Um, so you can't build mono because you haven't got mono yet, and, uh, and so on. And Haskell, and oh, that's all terrible. Um, so there is a set of nodes, effectively, from which everything else is built. You know, in theory, building all the packages in Debian is a tree. The problem is that it's all wrapped around in loops. Um, we don't have good tools to identify what the set of things uh, the canonical nodes are yet, so I'm not sure I know what some of them are, and there's probably some more. So uh, why do we care about this? I guess I've already mentioned that. The, the main reason is anybody who needs to make a new architecture. 
we kind of think, oh, that doesn't happen very often, but actually, it happens fairly often. Uh, I think they've been about 17 so far, so basically we do this every year. Um, the most recent, obviously, has been the RMHF um, bootstrap, which uh, has effectively been done twice, um, once by Konstantinos, who pretty much um, did it all native, um, and again recently by Sledge, who crossed most of the base system. Um, there are other uses for this, though. If we had this technology working so that it was actually possible to disentangle all the build dependencies, uh, it makes it much easier to do an optimized build. You know, if you wanted to build everything for Neon in ARM world, uh, in theory, you could use your existing packages to do that, but you're never quite sure whether that's actually going to work. Uh, so in some ways, there's something to be said for starting from scratch and building it all like that. Uh, then you're sure you haven't got random bits which are old style. You know, if you were pulling packages out of ARMEL to build your new thing, you might end up with a bit of a mix. Um, it was pointed out to me by whoever it was that recently bought the M68K, uh, or has been working on bringing M68K back up to date. Basically, that's now a cross-built architecture. They don't build it native anymore, uh, or not most of it. Um, and for them, they have the same problem of cyclic dependencies. There's also architectures we might want to have in the future one day, which pretty much can't build themselves because they're too weedy. Uh, AVR32 is a good example. Um, and it just seems to me fundamentally that you know, this is the universal operating system. And it's slightly embarrassing that you can't actually make a new port without Gintu or Open Embedded or something in order to get started. You know, that's how um, Konstantinos got RMHF started by using a Gintu based tarball uh, and then building enough Debian stuff on it that you could boot into that and pretend you'd started with Debian. Uh, it works. There's nothing wrong with it. But I just feel that we ought to be able to do this more correctly. So, uh, as I say, people use... Uh, so the Army L build was done with Angstrom. Do you want... Yeah, please, interrupt me. Microphone! Technology, I hate it. <laughs> anyway, my point was that uh, uh, I've seen uh, recovery of uh, broken upgrades uh, completely fail because of cyclic dependencies. So uh, if you have an uh, upgrade that's uh, triggering a full disk, uh, cyclic dependencies make it impossible to automatically recover. You have to do manual hard uh, uh, forced uh, installations of some packages to get going again. Uh, and that's because we have cyclic dependencies. The package system will just break the uh, upgrade in a random position and the uh, resulting systems will, system will be inconsistent and very, very hard to recover. So it's not just a nice thing for some setups. It's a day-to-day -day problem when you run into full disks. Right. Although you're talking there about cyclic install dependencies, which of course is slightly different from cyclic build dependencies. Um, although they are, as I'll explain in a minute, surprisingly tightly related. Yeah, just a comment. I've bootstrapped a few architecture in the past and now still again. And the situation is getting worse and worse. Today, for example, for installing developer, which is the minimum, it depends on man page. And for man page, you need basically xorg, you need qt, you need uh, gtk, php, and just because there are a lot of Python bindings, uh, Perl bindings, and all of documentation building. Yep, it's true. So, uh, yes, uh, it's, it's hard work for uh, a lot of reasons. So, at the moment, you, you take your package, you just keep removing bits until you can build it without all the stuff you didn't need, um, until eventually you've got some packages you can run, you know, enough to call a system. Um, but still, you know, and that you need to build hundreds and hundreds of packages until you've actually got all the dock packages needed for, for many perfectly boring builds, because you need the whole of tech, or the whole of QT, or the whole of something. Um, so, you know, the, the most we can minimize that, the better. Um, just mentioned xdeb here, which is a handy tool for cross-building things. Um, it's relatively painless. So Steve found that using that for the RMHF bootstrap was actually relatively painless for the base 112 packages you need for the bootstrap or something. There's actually 
uh, very few, only a few cyclic dependencies in that bit, I think. Um, so the reason why this is a, l a more tractable problem when you're cross-building than when you're native building is that all the stuff which is just doc tools, tech, and, you know, and anything which is just a tool, you've already got a version of that on your build system. So you haven't got to build tech before you can build anything with a man page, you know, or Groff, or whatever. Um, if you're doing this natively, you have got to do all that stuff, or stop all the docs being built. Um, so the cross case is basically where I've been uh, concentrating my analysis. You could do this again properly for the whole archive natively, um, and that would also be interesting, but that's not what I've done because I was trying to look at a slightly more tactical problem. So in fact, uh, if I get the right pictures, um, so here's a good example of a fairly typical build dependency tree. You go, let's find out <laughs> what the dependency loops are in this package. So you run some, you run some software and feed it to Dot, and you, get, and you go, oh dear. I mean, well, that hasn't really told me very much, has it? All it's told me. Can I suggest you stop saying dependency tree? A true. <laughs> yeah. So that's the thing. You all think it's a tree, don't you? You always thought it was a tree. It isn't. It looks like that. It's horrible. And actually, that's, that's been post-processed to get rid of some of it. That's GhostScript in a Maverick, which is particularly bad. Now, uh, Jonas, I don't know if he's here, uh, actually fixed it. So it doesn't depend on a million things. Uh, and in fact, it's dramatically improved already in Squeeze and in Natty. Um, but that's the sort of problem you have in even trying to analyze the problem. Um, what should we look at next? So what I did, so here we are. This is uh, a more tractable um, tree. So this is one which actually you'll find comes up hundreds and hundreds of times. This, this occurs about 600 times in um, the base of uh, Maverick, for example. Um, now this is uh, more or less what uh, Malkin was doing earlier, but this is the free software version, because we believe in that sort of thing over here. Um, so within that loop, there are, in fact, several loops. You know, as you can see, that's not just a loop. It's, it's several. But uh, a common problem in practice is Poplar. So Poplar depends on uh, some bit of Qt in order to display things, which means you need to build Qt. Uh, and that requires libodbc2, which needs GTK, which needs cups, which needs Poplar. <laughs> so that is absolutely typical of the problem you get. Um, and because, in fact, within this set of about 20 things is an awful lot of popular stuff, you know, like GTK and um, QT uh, and Arts and Cups and Pulse Audio and Blues and GConf and Glade, uh, it's very easy to get into this loop, which is why hundreds and hundreds of packages use something in here. And as soon as you use something in here, you, this is a problem for you. So uh, if I just show you, so yeah, so how do we get that tree, uh, tree, ha, huh, loop? <laughs> um, so I used Xdeb because uh, that understands about build dependencies and install dependencies in a way that DebTree, the other obvious tool for doing this, doesn't really. Um, I did have a go with uh, DebTree, that's the right thing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and that produces some interesting graphs, but it, it doesn't have this thing about something depends on a library, and that library requires a particular source package, and as soon as you need to be able to install that source package, you've got to install all the things which, um, so you need to build that source package, and then you need to install whichever library it was you wanted, and therefore you also need all the things that that library depends on. So although it's nominally about build dependencies. In fact, there's one level of build dependencies, and then as soon as you install anything, you suddenly care about all the install dependencies of that particular binary package as well. So a lot of the time, you care about both these things. And Xdeb uh, actually does a reasonable analysis um, and understands which architecture is which, and therefore when some of them don't apply. Um, the problem with that is that it produces graphs that look like this. So you go, oh dear, this is a bit of a mess again, isn't it? Um, if I get my buttons right, and you go, oh dear, yes, hmm, okay. Right, yeah, this still isn't really helping me understand the problem as much as I'd like. So <laughs> that's GNU PG. And you go, right, well, that didn't help, did it? So <laughs> what you need to do is find out 
the set of stuff that you actually care about in there. And it turns out that um, the dot tools are marvelous for this. There's a thing called SCC map, which is the strongly connected set. Uh, and that's the set of stuff which is actually connected back to itself again, as opposed to all the bits which really are trees and nodes and sticky out parts, because you don't care about those. They're easy. Um, so you fit it through SCC map. Um, so we added to XDEB the ability to, to spit out, effectively, the dependency set, uh, dependency graph that it had found uh, in dot format. Uh, you feed that through SCC to throw away all the bits that stick out sides. Uh, and then we feed it through a couple more handy scripts. There's this GVPR, which is magic set foo, which basically means you can color in the packages, which are, which are source packages, and you can make them round or square. And you can say, oh, there's, there's 15 different lines to that package. If we go back here a bit um, and find one. So you can see in the middle there, there's a lot of these that have got about 12 lines, or this that's got like 407 lines between two packages, because that dependency happens a lot. Uh, and you don't really care about that, you just you want to condense that down to one. Uh, and then, in fact, we added a number to it to say how many times it occurred. So after you've run through all that and processed it, you end up with something like this, which is, so this is a PostScript file which shows each of the separate loops within uh, required by that package in order to build. So, so a green blob is a source package, and a square blob is a binary. So that source depends on this binary, and to get that binary, you have to build that source, and so on. Um, we do actually have different shades of green according to how many things depend on it, which gives you a clue as to how many packages you're going to have to fiddle with. So it turns out, if you do this, so I ran it on all... Um, 1,500 packages in Ubuntu, and, and about half of the 20,000 odd in Debian before I got bored, um, that you end up with the same ones over and over and over and over again, which is good. Our problem is uh, slightly reduced in complexity there. So these are the typical cases. So there's this Qt poplar cups thing. Kerberos and open LDAP and something go around in a little loop of five. Lapak and Atlas depend on each other. Um, that glib one's thoroughly unimportant. I don't know why I wrote it down. WebKit happens quite a lot. And in recent stuff, object introspection has reared its even uglier head uh, and suddenly appears in uh, hundreds and hundreds of packages, whereas it didn't. I think it doesn't in Natty, but it does. Sorry, it didn't in Maverick, and it does in Natty. And it didn't in Squeeze, but it does in Wheezy. I believe that's correct. So. Here's some actual numbers, just because you know we like gratuitous statistics. So yeah, I ran through 9,200 odd packages. Actually, I'll just say how I ran through 9,000. So if you look in the XDEB package, if you download it, there's a, an examples blah directory, which has got a little script called find cycles, which essentially runs this stuff and has all those scripts in it. So you don't have to work that out again, because it was horrible. I, I should point out at this point that actually the guy who did the heavy lifting on all that graph work was Jonathan Austin, uh, not me. I've just stolen his very fine work and used it. Um, so, yeah, so out of 9,000 packages, 2,200 of them have some sort of build depth loop in them. So, 20-odd, 24%. Um, you know, nearly all of them have got this glib2 and gamin thing. Um, that's about to disappear, because I think gamin's almost extinct. Um, and I, I hope that's just, some, will suddenly evaporate. But in the meantime, this object introspection problem has turned up instead, which again happens nearly everywhere. The Poplar Kerberos thing. So that's actually two loops, Poplar and Qt and Cups, and there's Kerberos and OpenLDAP and something. But in fact, they've merged together in more recent packaging because um, of changing dependencies. WebKit and LibSoup happens a lot. This Lapack thing, even LVM. I, I forget what it is. It's RPM something something. And Maverick and Natty are fairly similar. Uh, I just analyzed the main set, which is rather smaller and a bit more tractable. It doesn't take very long to run the xdeb generate thing on each package, but you know it's maybe um, 30 seconds or something each. So uh, to do 10,000 takes a while. So uh, what are we going to do about this? The way to make 
to build the, all this stuff. Most of the build dependencies in these loops basically don't matter. It's because we build our packages maximally to include all the possible functionality. You know, if there's a handy little script that does something Qt-ish or there's a little UI piece, we build that. Um, but the things that depend on a package don't care about all that fluff. They only care about the core functionality. So actually, the, when, when we say we depend on, uh, you know, Kerberos depends on open LDAP, um, actually, Kerberos can be built without open LDAP, um, thereby breaking the loop. So what you have to do is modify the packages to build reduced versions, or staged builds or bootstrap builds. Uh, and so the question then comes down to what is the best mechanism for uh, doing that? Terminology, as I say, is a bit of a problem. There aren't a host of good words we haven't already used for something, but uh, I've, I've settled on this after a certain amount of thinking for the work I've done so far. So what you do is add a new dependency list to a new build depends list just in the package next to the existing one. So instead of the normal build depends, there's build depends stage one. Almost all packages only need a stage one. I think the only thing I know of that needs a stage one and a stage two is the toolchain build, which is a three-stage thing where you build the really, and, and it may be true for some of the language bootstraps as well, where you've got to build a mini language and then that builds a, some libraries and then you can build the real thing. Um, so basically you set an environment variable to say, or a, a, a dev build options, interesting question of exactly, again, what the best mechanism is. I, I reckon sticking it in build options is probably most sensible because this is fundamentally a slightly different build, yeah, much like not running the tests or whatever. Uh, and make sure all the tools recognize that so that they'll use the modified build depends list um, and then the rules file will not build the bits you didn't want and weren't necessary, so you get a modified package. Now, it's quite important that we don't go uploading those modified packages to real repositories, so you need a bit of marking on them to say, a wooga, um, this is um, horrible bodification for getting bootstraps done. Uh, microphone wanted down here. Um, but Hello? <laughs> this one works. This is working. working. I can do it. Okay, thanks for that. So I'm just thinking about whether you said sh they shouldn't be uploaded, but why? I mean, the package as it should work, it just doesn't provide the full functionality. So it might be a time in a bootstrapping architecture, it might be useful to share these. Of course, they need to be replaced before going to testing, stable, whatever. But what is the issue, for example, to upload those to experimental? And I can see in a, someone want to, wanting you to answer. Uh, I'm a bit short in... I'm a bit short in precise examples, but uh, I believe that there are cases where the staged build is sufficient for working your way around the loop until you can get to a proper build. Uh, it's not necessarily sufficient for building everything else. And uh, I think there are a few cases where if you build things outside the loop with uh, one of your staged builds, they'll accidentally leave out bits and you'll never know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, must have, I was thinking that we probably just wanted... You, you do want a repository of these things because there's, there's a complicated sequencing bit, which we'll get to in a minute, about how many things you build based on the modified package rather than waiting for the real one. Um, but, yeah, well, I'm interested to hear that um, uh, our release chappies uh, consider the possibility that uploading them might not be total craziness. So, um, so if we're going to uh, modify a load of packages in order to be able to do bootstrap builds, um, or stage builds, uh, you know, how many are there? Uh, having looked at the loop set, it's not that many. Uh, it's actually, it's quite difficult to work out when staring at this, how many 
actual changes you have to make to make that into a tree structure? That's not an entirely trivial question. Um, you know, how many loops is that? Um, some is the answer. Um, but I don't think, so as I say, although there's thousands and thousands of, of instances of depending on a loop, there aren't very many loops, actually. And most of them are actually coagulated into that big lump of 20 or 25, depending exactly which distro you're looking at. So once you've chopped all that up with, you know, maybe 10 cuts, um, so I, I don't think it's a very large number of packages affected, which is good. And the, pa the patches we need to make are, on the packages I've done so far, not uh, too ugly. So I think this is a maintainable thing. Um, to do it for the native case, where you've got to get rid of docs everywhere, at least, um, is more intrusive. Uh, on the other hand, if we just have a dev build ops, no docs, which is actually honored everywhere, that's, you know, that's quite generic. It's also useful for other things like embedded work um, and probably does most of the job here. For, is it working? Yeah. For the documentation part, it's also probably a lot of package can move the documentation building to build in dep. Yes. And so we don't have the dependency there. And probably multi-arch will help there because we have to split the documentation from the libraries to a common package. Uh, and still also there is a lot of package to fix that are building the documentation in any case, even if you build only the, the Arch, um, Arch package, even if it's not in the final deb. So probably there is a work to do there without uh, going to the no doc uh, option. Yes, uh, it's a good point. The, if we actually make the build in depth thing work, then you know, that separates out the architecture independent stuff from the architecture dependent stuff uh, at build time, so it's easy to do part of it. Uh, and that will reduce our trees, not trees, I'm going to stop doing that, graphs, uh, enormously. So here's an example of the sort of patch you end up with. This is Kerberos 5, stopping it using LDAP. So it's quite easy in Deb Helper. There's this marvelous thing I didn't know about until I tried this, of dash capital N package name, which basically says, don't do that package, throw out the whole set of Deb Helper commands, just pretend it's not there, um, which is great. Uh, there's actually this little wrinkle which wouldn't fit on my slide, um, which means actually you have to modify a few more lines with plus I and plus A, because uh, DH options are used for more than one thing, which is a little bit ugly. Um, but basically, that's all you need to do. Change the configure options, um, ignore a package so it doesn't get built, and a little bit of jiggery-pokery for not moving around some files that don't exist. And similarly, for Poplar is a CDBS package um, where we can still use DH options. Uh, so there's more dash capital Ning and more configuring, and, and you're done. So you know that doesn't look too ugly and evil to me. I think that's the sort of thing we could probably sustain in uh, you know, a set of packages, 40 or 50. In order to have this actually working and useful, as well as modifying the packages to have staged builds, or you know, reduced builds, uh, you want some tools to do this for you because it's hard work staring at all those graphs working out which thing to build next. That's the thing we're missing. Uh, so you need to analyze the tree um, or the graph. <laughs> um, and then when you find it's got a loop in it, you go, all uh, right, have any of these packages got a staged build I can use to um, chop the line and turn it back into a tree? Um, if so, do that build. So just deep package, build package, dev build options equals blah. Um, when you've done that, you can then build the other things in the loop that depend on it, uh, and then you can rebuild a normal build of the offending package. So um, I have a GSOC student, Gustavo Elkmim, who's been working on this. Um, he's discovered that it's quite complicated. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hard GSOC project. So uh, I'm not quite sure how much actual tool we're going to get, because I think we're finished in about two or three weeks' time. But um, we have started on this project of um, generating a handy tool. You know, we might end up sticking it in XDEB for now as something that has most of the right infrastructure already. Um, the problem with this is that we don't use it very often. I mean, OK, we do a new port every year or so. Um, but package maintainers are not habitually going to be building their packages with staged builds. So it's the sort of thing that will get terrible bit rot. So Because one of the things we've done is reproduce the list of build dependencies. So you've got build depends blah, and then you've got build depends stage one, which is the same list exactly with one package missing or something. 
I did think about a syntax that just said except foo, but the problem is that sometimes it's an alternative and not um, an exception. You could invent some new syntax, but then you've got to change all the tools to understand the new syntax. Whereas if you just reproduce it slightly different, you give it to the tools exactly as is, and it's, it's very simple, and I can write the patches. So. He said you could write a said script, which would generate the changed set of uh, build dependencies, but that's because he's an evil man. Uh, so uh, I think it's quite important, actually, that we have some machinery trying the stage builds of packages that have them to see whether they build and, and filing um, fail to staged build from source errors somewhere, or at least a website, so you can check current status. Uh, so if anyone wants to help with that, that would be marvelous, because um, like I say, I'm not supposed to be doing this. I would expect that most of the problems, there, there will be some problems with in the rules file or whatever, but I would expect that most of them will be uh, graph uh, re untreeing problems. Yes, uh, you mean, you mean the, the, set, the, the, the tree will change, the graph will change shape, so suddenly a new package becomes important and has to be modified too. Right, so, so you can, once you've got to the point of doing uh, the graph analysis entirely automatically, mm. then you should be able to spot a lot of the problems entirely automatically without having to go through a full reboot strap auto build Indeed. to discover it. So we can start off with a fairly simple mindless thing that just builds the ones we know are an issue, but at some point we actually want to analyze the whole archive graph, uh, decide what to do, and then check that those packages, that it's possible to turn the thing into a tree. Actually, I really think what one should do after that is working is, for example, just uh, bootstrap AMD64 again every few times because it's quite fast to rebuild. Mm -hmm. We can see it, and I really think that once it's really working, we should consider to make failure, to make uh, uh, bootstrapping harder, should be considered as a very bad behavior. And so, it's, it's will, if you do it uh, routinely, it will, we can prevent to let it rot. Um, so I think we really should go in that direction. And now uh, I give the hand to the microphone back to Alexander to move again. There was someone at the back there wanted to say something. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but that's exactly the kind of thing we're looking at. Maybe you know, set this up automatically to to, to do a new a bootstrap of a new pretend architecture every weekend or something, and then submit the bugs. Clearly, that's where we want to get to uh, eventually. There's a certain amount of work to be done before we're there, but yes. I have a small comment regarding the the cycle, the, the breaking cycle uh, algorithm. It makes me think a lot about the APT algorithm that we use to install the packages that are in a cycle. And uh, I mean, all the the code should be fairly um, should be kind of the same. Isn't except it? that it is. You except that it only problem. looks at dependencies, install dependencies. It doesn't look at build dependencies. Yeah, so sure. We have to do that mapping back to the corresponding source packages. But, but in practice. In practice, it's the same problem. I, I would love it if somebody who understands graph theory and that sort of thing and recursion and stuff were to do that because it makes my head hurt. Um, yes, so what else? Uh, there's some documentation about this. If you want to read, it is, as ever, slightly out of date with respect to this presentation, but uh, it's pretty good. Uh, as uh, Steve Langesek said, if you want to get something like this changed, you need to write down exactly what it is that should be done. Uh, so I've started writing down exactly what it is that should be done, and that's what's on the Debian Bootstrap wiki page. So anyone who feels this is interesting, please read that. Um, it doesn't have the patches that I've done there yet, but it will have any minute now. Um, there's also, uh, I said there were a set of very common uh, build loops. There's actually about 20 odd I've found so far, uh, and the circular build dependency page lists the um, boring text file of those. Um, the other aspect of this is cross-building, because uh, in practice, uh, the analysis I've done is only for the cross-building case. Sorry, uh, yeah. Before we get to cross-building, I, I uh, noticed that uh, uh, almost all of the, those loops involve at, at least one uh, multi-arch for foreign um, uh, package. 
Uh, you don't care uh, uh, with, uh, what architecture, um, uh, for example, uh, tech is uh, when you build the documentation. Correct. So, so, so uh, uh, almost all of this program problem uh, with uh, suddenly disappear the moment uh, multi-arch... Uh, no, uh, because the analysis I've done is assuming that that problem has already disappeared. So the much larger problem in worrying about all that stuff will indeed get much better. But I've done the analysis for assuming we're already there. Uh, not ev every single loop uh, will disappear, but, but uh, uh, I guess I did yes, almost but the, all. So the graphs I've showed you are with all that stuff stripped out, uh, apart from that first one. Ten minutes. Um, yeah, so uh, there's, I, I created a new cross tag just to keep track of cross build issues because um, there's quite a few of those. Um, so there is now a tag and user name thing to file cross bugs on. And if you go to that URL, you can find out about them. And uh, there's also a fair amount of documentation appearing as a result of uh, Linaro caring about this and me wanting to write things down before I forget. Um, this is useful if you haven't done much cross building before and would like to get started, especially in new multi-arch world where everything will be lovely. Currently, it's not actually very lovely. It's nothing like as lovely as Steve showed. That's uh, um, slightly lovelier if you're in an Eric than if you're in Wheezy. But you know, give it a, a few weeks, and uh, things really will improve dramatically. Um, Auto cross builder. So this is the same problem as for the bootstrapping issue. There's also do packages cross build, uh, to which the answer is in many cases no. Uh, but you can only find out by trying it at the moment. It will be handy if there was a a build the web page with thousands of packages saying, did it cross-build or not, using the standard infrastructure, um, which has been on my list to do for months, and I haven't quite got around to it yet. So again, anyone who's terrifically enthused, um, either just do that or come and see me, and I'll tell you how I think it should be done. Um, so to open this up a little bit in the um, eight minutes that are left, um, what do we think about this? Uh, do we think this is something which should be in Debian? Uh, generally, uh, we should perhaps make it policy that uh, it should be possible to bootstrap the whole thing. There are no irremovable circular build dependencies. Um, I'm interested in whether people uh, think the staging name is sensible or the bootstrapping name is better, and what the, you know, what, whether we should use deb build options or some other environment variable or even just options. Um, there's all sorts of ways you could implement this. Uh, I've picked something. Um, package maintainers. So looking at that big graph, there's all sorts of places you could break the loops. And some of them will be easy, and some of them will be hard. So we've done a few. Uh, in fact, the ones I've looked at, it's usually fairly obvious. Um, but anyway, if any package maintainers who see that their packages are in the graphs uh, and go, oh, well, it's trivial to just not build it with foo, because usually, Upstream does not have this problem. Upstream will use some configure foo, and if it's not present and it doesn't need it, it'll just not bother and carry on doing the build. It's normally the Debian packaging, which is less flexible than the auto foo underneath. Uh, so generally, you know, this is, this is our problem, to make our packaging a bit more flexible in the way that autoconf is. Um, as you just spoke about auto foo stuff, I was already considering whether we could, couldn't, and I mean, we know which build depends we are and we check them. So we could let the out of food stuff a bit more open and say, well, if these ones are missing, we just do the, still the right thing, just not let so much. So we don't need to filter everything out. So perhaps that's a direction um, which might be even helpful in other cases where we say, you could, you could leave these parts out of the package, it will still be correct, it will do something, but perhaps not the full backend functionality. Which you, might you, be useful for, uh, for other things than only bootstrapping. Are you suggesting build depends recommends? Uh, then it's not depends recommends, but basically something build in that recommends, direction. Build recommends, yeah. Just as a thought, I'm not sure if mm. it's good. So I think we did think about build recommends and decided that that was a little bit scary and we weren't quite sure what to do with it. But it is an interesting idea and would be a little bit more like what you're trying to represent. So you briefly skipped across this, but there are some really uh, awkward packages, particularly uh, languages, that um, are really very hard to cross-build or indeed bootstrap or anything. Are you, are you, you basically just decided that's too hard to think about now and we'll do it by banging our head against a brick wall as usual? 
uh, yeah, they, it is possible to get your language, everything in the archive bootstrapped. We do it regularly. Now, and some of the cases that are very difficult to cross-build are simply because the upstream's build infrastructure is shoddy, uh, and we should probably just get them to fix it. Um, Colin. When, when we've worked on these problems so far, we, uh, we have fixed, I think, Perl and Python so far. Haskell is resisting sanity, but uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, I think most of the major languages in the archive should cross-build now to some degree. Sorry? I don't know. Oh, Ada as well. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, but, well, it, it is uh, evil but or a, it is a fixed. number of th and, uh, while it, while it's orthogonal to this to some extent because it is within one package and can be dealt with by existing mechanisms. We don't have to invent new mechanisms for it, um, but uh, you do have to solve that problem as well. Yes. Yes. I mean, ideally, every package in Debian would also cross-build, and practice for the moment probably twenty percent of them do. I don't know. Um, no, I guess you're right. It's probably better. There's a lot of fairly simple stuff. Further up the tree, actually, it gets a bit easier in many ways because you know it's a standard thing that depends on some libraries and that kind of stuff usually works. Um, but yes, that is, like I say, th th these, these, these problems are closely related, but they're not the same thing, and we can separate them. Um, yes, uh, so that's it. I've finished. Um, is there anything else people wish to ask? Did I make sense? I came here late, but I just want to add that uh, you showed a big, huge graph in the beginning with a uh, Go script in it, and uh, I believe that one is solved. Yes. Uh, thanks to you showing me the horrible graph. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was, it, was the, it was the biggest evil-looking graph I had to hand on my computer, so I thought <laughs> it illustrated the point, even though, in fact, uh, it's now uh, moot. Um, yeah. Oh well. So there's already, as Wookie said, we have a load of cross-build patches already been filed in the BTS. Um, as I was going through cross-building uh, what was going to be a NATI-based um, system, and Wookie's been lo looking at other stuff too, um, for every bug that we found, just about, I think we have patches ready. Um, please, if you have one of those patches against your package, um, if it doesn't, if you're not convinced it works, if you want to talk about it, please talk to us. Don't just ignore it. We would really like to get this stuff going. Yes, we, actually, one thing I think would be useful to have an argument was whether failure to cross-build should be counted as something other than a wish list bug, which is traditionally the status they've achieved in Debian at the moment, because we go, we don't care. We build everything natively. Um, now, I don't know whether, if I were to suggest that at the very least they should be normal bugs, there'd be uh, any dissent. Is there any dissent in this room? Oh, well, that'll do then. <laughs> oh, is that some dissent I saw over there? <laughs> no? Do you want a microphone? Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd say if it's a package that should be able to cross-build easily, then it's okay having it normal. But packages like languages that maybe uh, need themselves as a compiler to compile for the other architecture, um, if it hasn't been supported previously, it might be a bit too much to say it's a real bug, it's just something that doesn't work and it's upstream doesn't provide it. Um, so that's a little bit of dissent just to I make sure we're Debian. A, a piece of metadata saying whether you expect this to work or not might be useful, might it? If someone could think of a sensible way of defining that. Uh, yeah. Actually, I think we should handle it like lots of other cases. I mean, if it's rather trivial to do it, then I really think it's a bug that should be fixed, and, uh, and we should really be ashamed of not fixing it, which, which translates to it's an important bug. I mean, if it's quite an obscure thing where you need to put a few weeks of porting in, then that's a bit different. I mean, if you provide a patch, I would assume that the maintainer should apply them anyways, which means, yes, I would rather consider them as important in the normal case, but in other cases, there might be wish lists like, oh, please uh, make GAC to do ghost building. I'm not sure if that's a really good idea, but that's something else. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you get a bit of an argument with Upstream who has an opinion about how it should be built, which isn't the same way Debian's doing things, and that can be, uh, you know, like the Apache stuff, for example, is, is an abomination. 
Um, and you know, they've tried to make cross-building, cross-platform stuff work, but they've done it in such a way as to completely break cross-building, which seems a bit perverse to me. But um, that's quite a long argument because it's complicated. Uh, I guess I should stop. So thank you all for uh, coming to listen. I hope that was informative. <laughs>